All right, I think we're ready to start. Hi everyone, and welcome to my Q3 quarterly call for 2023. On the agenda today, I will talk briefly about my background and my investment journey, my the expectations you should have when copying me, my strategy, the themes I invest in, and my goals. I'll talk about the key topics that occurred through Q2 of this year, so that's looking backwards, as well as a performance review of my portfolio and some of the major indices. And I will also be talking about any portfolio changes that I made. And then lastly, I'll talk about the themes that I anticipate towards the end of this year, the second half of this year that we're already in, as well as my closing remarks. All right. By the way, if you've seen this, I will upload this to YouTube and you can skip this chapter and jump straight to any of the other sections that you find most relevant. I'm an immigrant to the UK, so I moved from South Africa to London when I was 28 in 2008. Uh, at this point in time, I have more than 20 years worth of experience as a consultant and entrepreneur. I've started several businesses. I'm a published author. I have a book to my name. It's uh, technology-based and I've spoken at some very large technology events around the world, some of the largest events, and I am almost entirely a full-time popular investor, although I do work with a number of uh, startups. A few lightning facts, I do like gaming and my favorite game is Overwatch. I was 16 when I made my first money as a tech consultant in my neighborhood, and I was 19 when I got my first gray hair, which I think was related to the uh, early start that I had when it comes to working. In terms of my stock investment journey, so I started investing when I was 19 in 99 during the dot-com bubble, just about when it burst and I burnt my fingers badly, as you can expect. I think just about everyone that gets involved in the markets burns their fingers at first and potentially several times. I am self-educated uh, initially when it comes to stock investments, although I formalized this knowledge through the 2010s, uh, through courses and certain studies. I joined eToro in 2015. A friend of mine was talking about eToro. I was very impressed by the breadth of assets that I had available and how easy it was to invest. And I became a popular investor in 2016. I am also a property investor, so I'm diversified outside of eToro and outside of stock and bond classes of assets. I'm also an angel investor. Um, I do have a crypto portfolio that I've held for a very long time outside of eToro. And I advise uh, a few different companies. Um, usually because I invest in them. Now, when you are investing in anything, and this doesn't matter if it's a popular investor or an ETF, a particular stock or a bond, whatever, it is incredibly important to have the right expectations for the outcomes there. I think that one of the largest reasons that people jump around in investments is because their expectations aren't aligned to the behavior of that particular asset. As an example, if you are someone that knows they get very panicked when their investments drop suddenly, um, although you might become incredibly elated when they run very high, you, you probably know that, uh, well, you probably shouldn't be investing in cryptos because they're incredibly volatile. There'll be a lot of upside sometimes, but then there will be um, also a lot of downside. In a similar way, if you are someone that's young and you've got some money to splash around, and you're looking to learn more and you don't mind the volatility, um, then you probably don't need to invest in very big companies that aren't growing at all and reward their investors, for example, only with dividends. Um, so it's important to align your expectations with a particular asset type that you're investing in. And you can have different expectations for different things that you invest in. Just make sure that you know you aren't expecting crazy high returns from your super low risk investments and vice versa. Now on to what you should expect from my portfolio as an investment vehicle. Well, I expect higher volatility than the broader market, and this is because I invest in companies that are typically growth businesses. Uh, over the long term, I expect their share prices to climb quite nicely. Over the short term, there could be many ups and downs, and that could mean that there will be higher returns in the broader market over multi-year timeframes. But in the intervening period, it's going to be quite a rocky ride, potentially. Examples of the types of companies that I'm looking for when I invest are the young companies that one day will be the next um, Amazon, Google, Facebook, etc. So the companies that are smaller now, 
they're riskier because they are smaller than haven't captured the market like these giants have. But that means that the potential for reward is large as long as you're willing to go along for that ride. I like to pull up this uh, case study, this investor behavior case study, and I'm aware that my head is blocking part of it, so I'll read that part of it for you. So Peter Lynch's Magellan Fund, I love Peter Lynch, fantastic, very famous investor, had the best 20-year return of any mutual fund ever. The fund averaged an annual return of 29.2% during that period. Incredible. So if you'd been invested for that 20-year period with $100,000, you'd be a very, very wealthy person today. However, Lynch found that it was the behavior of people that had invested in that fund that meant that they did not make the returns that the fund actually did. By his calculation, he found that the average investor in his fund only made around 7% during that same period where his fund returned 29% per year. And this is because people would jump out of the fund, they would sell out of their position when times were bad, and then money would flow back in when times were good. And they would have missed the recovery portion after the fall of that particular fund. I want to spend a little bit of time talking about my investment strategy. So I like to think about it in terms of these four, what I call pillars. So my investment style is long-term. So I invest for at least months and usually years. I try to invest with a business owner mindset. I'm not gambling in the stock market. I own a little chunk of these companies. And so I think about those businesses as though I'd started them myself, as though I'm an executive working within that company. If stocks aren't cheap, I'm willing to pay a little bit of a premium for them as long as they are high quality businesses that deserve that premium. I prefer companies that are profitable and growing their profitability. Uh, I'm typically more US focused than other geographies because the US market has just trounced other markets through the past many decades and I expect volatility. In terms of my analysis style, I focus on bottom up analysis, so I'm fundamentals focused, I'm focused on the business itself. For those of you that watch my weekly videos, you'll know that I like to keep an eye on macroeconomics, but actually it factors very little in my investment decisions unless there is a macro wave of change that's going to impact a particular industry for one to two decades. I prefer to understand the business model, the competitors, the leadership team, etc. I want these companies to be in growing industries. And then, like I said, macroeconomics features slightly, depending on the circumstances, politics features slightly, although politics are generally not long lived. So they, the impact of politics might be for a matter of months or years in many instances, but um, usually not decades, although it can. And technical analysis is part of my analysis style. There are certain elements of technical analysis, usually the, the simplest types of technical analysis, do tell you about the psychology of the stock market when it comes to a particular asset. In terms of my strategy implementation, the bulk of my portfolio is multi-month or multi-year. A small portion might be involved in momentum trades. And then once in a while, I might hedge the portfolio in one way or the other. I usually build positions over a period of time. And this is because even though something looks cheap at a particular point in time, it can fall further. I'm sure you've noticed this about the stock market yourself. And so I'm happy to build a position averaging over whatever period is required. I don't use leverage because it comes with a cost. And I do hedge sometimes, but hedging also has a cost. Hedging is insurance. And in the same way that you pay insurance for your car, or your house, or whatever, um, when you pay, when you take a hedge out against your portfolio, there will be some kind of a price to pay almost always. In terms of my investment expectations, I already mentioned this, but I expect my portfolio to have higher returns than the market of the long term, but also bigger drawdowns than the markets in the intervening periods. A very simplified view of my strategy when it comes to portfolio construction is a core and satellite approach. There is something called core and satellite out there. Mine is a slight variation on that. So in the core of my portfolio, by far the bulk of my positions will be very large, well-established, diversified companies. And this is because these companies tend to be lower risk. If the economy turns sour, these businesses are better equipped to weather out the storm. It's not just their particular businesses, but also they have access to more capital a lot of the time, either their own cash or drawdown facilities or whatever. And then around that, that core of heavy hitters, I usually have a number of smaller companies who are high risk, but also have a larger potential to have more growth than the companies that are in that core. 
The reason for constructing my portfolio like this is that I do want to balance risk with the reward of high growth companies in the portfolio. When I am looking at companies, considering them to become part of the portfolio, uh, there are a number of desirable business traits that I will look for. Of course, it depends on the industry and the size of the business, but in general, I want the company to have a feasible, feasible business model. You wouldn't believe how many companies out there don't have a feasible business model. Uh, they're burning money uh, with the hopes of one day becoming profitable, but there isn't a clear path to that profitability. I want the, the management team to be fantastic. Uh, they should be experts in whatever they do. They should also be honest people, people that you're trusting with your money, so they need to be honest. The company should operate in a growth industry, and growth doesn't always mean tech. By the way, for example, copper is very likely to be a growth industry for the next couple of decades because of the demand for copper when it comes to electric vehicles, but also the electrification of the world. I prefer the company to be an industry leader, at least in the top three for that particular industry, and hopefully the leader within that industry. I like companies that are profitable or they're on a trajectory that suggests profitability in the near term. So some companies that have grown their revenue quite rapidly but aren't profitable just yet um, are on a trajectory if you go through the historical numbers that show you more or less when they're expected to become profitable. I prefer companies that have a genuine moat so that the core business should be incredibly difficult to replicate. So an example might be a large company would be Rolls-Royce. They have a number of aspects to their business that are just about unique. There are one or two companies in the world that can do what they do, for example, building nuclear submarines or building jet engines. I also prefer the companies to be reasonably priced. It's fantastic if they're very cheap. I love buying very cheap stocks, just like everyone else. However, it's okay if they are only reasonably cheap, uh, but there is a reason for that premium on that particular company. And does the company have a je ne sais quoi? Does it have that special something, either a, a person in the company that's able to achieve incredible things, or it is something that they're doing that is just unlike any other kind of business out there? And this might be just the brand of the company, might be their, their special something. Moving on to some of the largest holdings in the portfolio at the moment, including their performance for the first half of this year. These numbers aren't exact, but they're roughly right, by the way. So Amazon is closely correlated with the business cycle, a nice rebound this year, they're up 60%. Disney was doing quite well through this year, but have had some challenges. The company is well diversified and is evolving very well with the times. The return for Disney so far for the first half of this year is roughly 0%. However, if you go through the numbers for Disney, you'll see that they are incredibly cheap for what the company is achieving in terms of revenue and profitability. Uh, Volkswagen, a similar story to Disney, perhaps not as well diversified because they make cars, but they are a fantastic brand, huge opportunity in EVs, and the price looking at the uh, growth and revenue and forecast growth and earnings is fantastic. Rolls-Royce, as I mentioned, a company with an enormous moat. They're in the middle of a turnaround. They've got a new CEO. They've been cutting back on costs, and they're up nearly 120% for the year. Warner Brothers Discovery, uh, a company that I think will do very, very well through the next few years, a media uh, mega house. And the reason that the stock price has taken such a beating is because they inherited a very large amount of debt as part of the merger between Warner Brothers and Discovery. However, they've demonstrated that they are able to eat away at that debt at a decent clip of 41% for the year, and I think there's a lot more to come. Canadian Solar, one of my favorite solar companies out there. They tend to get a bad rap because of their strong association with China, but please go look at the, the numbers in your favorite stock screen and you'll see that this is a company that's not only growing very fast in terms of revenue and profitability, but also just keeps on landing project after project. And solar is most certainly the future. Mercad Libre, one of my favorite businesses, a South American powerhouse, uh, kind of like the Amazon of South America, although they don't have the AWS components. Uh, every earnings is just fantastic. They tend to beat enormously each time. And Square, has the stock price has done very well through this year. Uh, Square, now called Block, was a darling of uh, Cathy uh, from Arc, and the share price is down 7% for the first half of the year. However, again, if you look at the numbers, you can see that they are hitting record revenues, record profitability uh, every single quarter, 
and I think it's just a matter of time before their fortunes turn. In terms of my lifetime goal, uh, so I want to look back and say that I've had a career where for 20 years I've achieved a compound annual growth rate of 25% or more. This is a very big goal. Not many people with a public record have been able to achieve this, and I'm currently sitting on a CAGR of 21%. So I've got some work to go in order to get that up to 25%, but I think that I can do it. In terms of the Q2 headlines, so the big things that happened through Q2, so the tech rally continued. Um, people are terming this the second most hated rally, the first being the rally out of the bottom of the coronavirus crash. The Nasdaq 100 ended Q2 at 40% for the first half of the year, an incredible rally, and I'm not sure that that return was entirely justified despite the crazy sell-off through last year. The second major headline uh, is that inflation in the US, by the way, has fallen below rates and has stuck there for quite some time. I expect that the US Federal Reserve will want this to be the case for a while. They will also want inflation to get closer to 2% before they start bringing rates down. So I don't think rates are going to drop anytime soon. People are starting to say probably towards the middle of next year. A few other tidbits from Q2 headlines that I think made uh, their share of a difference. So there has been a large slowdown in the Chinese economy. This is despite the Chinese government doing all kinds of things to uh, stoke, not stock, stoke the, the, the flames of growth. Uh, these don't seem to have worked just yet. China is coming out of an enormous financial crisis, uh, akin to the one that the West saw in 2008. So this isn't a huge surprise, and I expect this to continue for a while longer. China continues to do things to try and bring growth back. Earnings, surprisingly, have continued to be Incredibly resilient, particularly in the US, but you know, Europe has done its fair share of uh, putting out great earnings too. The US's GDP is strong, and this has surprised just about everyone to the upside. It looks as though the Federal Reserve might get what they want uh, through a bit of luck, but also, you know, this is what they were aiming to achieve. US employment, the labor market continues to be quite strong. The mega caps are where the vast bulk of this rally has come from, although recently the rally has spread out a little bit more. And you don't want to have a narrow rally uh, in a bull market. It makes the rally very weak and very susceptible to a collapse. The US dollar has weakened, and this is just a natural side effect of people becoming more optimistic. The US dollar is a safe haven and people rush to it in times of fear, but also when the US had high rates and other countries didn't have high rates just yet, uh, the return on bonds uh, denominated in USD was, was quite good. Some South American countries are now talking about um, cutting their rates fairly soon, so before the end of this year. And UK inflation continues to be incredibly high and not really coming down very fast at all, despite what the central bank has been uh, trying to do. In terms of Q2 performance statistics, I know that my head is over the bottom left hand number once again, so I'll read it out. For the period from the beginning of April, to the last day of June 2023, that's how I measure Q2. The return of my portfolio was about 11.9%, which means that my lifetime return for the duration that I've been on eToro, which is from March 2015 until the end of June 2023, is 375%. The NASDAQ gave a return of 15.9% for the same period, and for the lifetime that I've been on eToro, their return, the NASDAQ's return has been 241%. The SP 500, provided a return of 8.5.4% for Q2 and the Russell 2000 4.8%. You can see the Russell 2000 is lagging the other two major US indices quite a lot. And that gives you some insight into the size of businesses that have been driving the recent rally, but also the rally through the past half a decade or so. Looking now at changes to my portfolio. So not a huge amount of change in terms of things that I bought. I added Hargreaves Lansdowne to my portfolio. Hargreaves Lansdowne is one of the largest investment platforms within the UK, one of the largest 100 companies in the UK. The share price was battered for a number of reasons um, leading into this year. However, I think they've left a lot of those behind. They've done a lot of work within the business. And I think that their share price is going to do very well off of the back of a strong business performance over the next few years. In terms of hedges that I have in place at the moment, I'm holding on to a number of US 7 to 10 year bonds through an ETF 
on eToro. And that's because when rates start to come down, uh, bonds will start to appreciate once again. In terms of things that I have sold out from the portfolio, so Shopify, Micron, Netflix, and Palantir are all gone. Um, Shopify, Netflix, and Palantir have done very well for my portfolio, but we're looking very expensive. So I sold out of those positions. Micron, I am very concerned about the impact of politics on their business. Politics in this case being the ongoing battle between the US and China. China now saying that Micron is a security concern and that it needs to block sales of Micron's chips within China, which is a very large chunk of Micron's revenue. Looking forward through the second half of this year, I think that in certain geographies we will start to see rates fall. However, I don't think that's likely to happen in the US, Europe, or the UK. What we might see though from central banks in those countries is that they start turning a little bit more dovish, which is the thing that happens before they start talking about rates dropping once again. Will inflation bounce back up? So in order for inflation to hit a target of 2%, the month-on-month -month number needs to drop significantly from where it has been recently, and this is becoming quite challenging, uh, especially with things like service inflation in the UK and Europe being quite high, and the potential for, on the far right, energy inflation once again. There is still a very large war going on in Ukraine, and it will take many years for countries in Europe uh, to find alternatives to completely fulfill their energy requirements through winter. So we can expect them to be paying slightly higher prices every time winter comes around. And a soft landing, will we see one or not? It's looking more and more likely in the US, at least in the short, maybe medium term. I'm not sure what happens beyond that. Um, will we see recessions at all within the largest leading uh, economies within the West? Um, it's looking fairly unlikely, actually. And the funny thing about this, that's something that I would like you to bear in mind next time there's some sort of large-scale economic collapse, is that the experts, the people closest to the details, the central bankers themselves, got this very, very, very wrong. Uh, so if they can't get it right, there's very little chance that anyone else is going to be able to. All right, getting towards the end of the presentation now, so just a reminder that patience is your strongest ally within the, the stock market or investing. As long as you're doing your homework and you're fairly diversified, I think that you are in a good position as long as you've got a strong stomach and you are patient. So the orange line within the chart on screen is the NASDAQ 100. Below that is the S&P 500. You can see that the NASDAQ 100 has provided a significantly stronger return than the S&P 500 over this duration, a 23 year duration or so. More than double the return of the S&P 500. However, that came with the cost. It came at the cost of uh, you having to deal with much higher volatility in your investment in the NASDAQ 100. And there would have been periods where the NASDAQ 100 would have significantly underperformed the S&P 500. So just bear in mind that as long as you've done your homework and you've got the stomach for volatility, you really need to be patient. Patient on the scale of multiple years if you want to outperform the uh, market. All right, before we move on to Q&A, just my closing remarks. The, the rally from Q1 continued through Q2. I suspect that bears capitulating uh, were part of the reason that we saw stocks push a little higher. But we should also note that the rally was very narrow. It broadened out a little bit, but the biggest gains were in the mega caps and in tech mega caps in particular. This is this is not healthy. So I do expect a bit of a correction, and I think that that is what's actually underway right now in Q3. The macroeconomic outlook looks decent near term. Uh, it seems that central banks are getting what they want. People are still spending. If you look at retail sales numbers, the labor market seems to be quite resilient. Um, so, but some valuations for businesses are still very high, so cautiousness is required. I think that a soft landing might be on the cards, active word might. And so this is not the time to chase uh, returns on stocks that have grown highly through the recent period and are looking very expensive when compared to peers. Luckily, there are still some companies out there that are still quite cheap and are doing quite well in this economy that define um, the experts through the first half of this year. All right, that's it for my Q3 updates. 
Um, if you have any questions, please let me know.